this. It's really important because what we want to understand is that the way of Christ is the way which he invites us into to live our full life. I love the old hymn, I come to the garden alone, but I don't want to leave him in the garden. And you'll notice that some of the words of our beloved old hymns are just a little bit, uh, well, they in need a little of instruction. Um, he doesn't bid me go with a voice of woe. <laughs> he bids me walk with him in the fruit of the Spirit, joy, peace, love. And he says, let's go get him, tiger. <laughs> See, that's, that's Jesus. Uh, and uh, we really need to take the teachings of Jesus and make them frontline instruction on reality. That's what we try to do when we teach, is to bring people in touch with reality. It's not just the teachings. It's the reality which the teachings point to that matter. And so when we say the kingdom of the heavens is at hand, or the kingdom of God is at hand, that means you can count on it. It's like saying, if you forgive the crude metaphor, electricity is at hand. Well, now that's an interesting case. And you know how interesting it is when the power goes off, don't you? <laughs> you say, electricity is no longer at hand. And for most of the history of humanity, it wasn't in hand. I mean, I was raised way down in the Missouri Ozarks where the three bears live. <laughs> and the only electricity we had for most of my life there was what you got in lightning. Uh, it's not very useful, you know. Um, so thank goodness these people like old Ben Franklin, he gets out there with his kite and his key. It's a wonder he didn't get killed <laughs> on the spot. <laughs> you know? But he was willing to find out something about electricity. And through a period of time, we have come to where you just flip a switch. Right? Electricity is at hand. Atomic power is at hand. I'm not sure that we're ready for that. <laughs> because we haven't come to be at home in the kingdom of God. And it's only for people who are at home in the kingdom of God and adapted by their character and their understanding and their walk and talk with Jesus that is able to bear power. And the story of the Christian people, the followers of Christ, following him has always been development of character and power. And the church often has divided and said, we'll take character, we'll, we don't know about power. And then you got the others that want the power but are short on character. See, and the combination is what we want. That's what we see in Jesus. And Jesus came to bring the kingdom of God to us in an available form. If all you can do is set off atomic bombs, that's not very useful. You want to bring the power down to where it is available, and that is what Jesus does, and that's what he teaches us. And I, I know some guy named Dallas Willard is quoted over the side here. I hope you really think about that statement. He said... The spiritual formation field lacks intellectual rigor and testable information needed to put the gospel and spiritual life in Christ on the cognitive map for the multitudes of people who are hungry for something real. 
I like that. <laughs> That's really good. Let's work on that. So that's what we're doing now. Last uh, evening, we want to touch base with where we were. And last evening, we, we spoke at length about two kinds of life, two ways of life, the life of the flesh, the life of the spirit. And we talked about reigning in life through Jesus Christ. And uh, Bill helped us so much by putting the kingdom of God right down in the world where we live and helping us see that everything we do is an opportunity to know the presence of God in our lives. And, uh, of course, his presence is much greater than his speaking to us. But you can't live that life without him speaking to you. And, uh, of course, he's already put a lot of things on record. And the second session today, I want to spend mainly talking about the Sermon on the Mount in this context of God speaking. Um, but we want to have really firmly fixed this picture of two ways of life. And I go back for a moment to Romans 8, verse 5. Those who live in terms of the flesh set their mind on things of the flesh. And those who live in terms of the Spirit set their mind on things of the Spirit. Okay? That's the key. Where do you set your mind? It is the mind of the Spirit that gives us entree into the full life with God in Christ and claims everything that we do then. So I don't just come to the garden alone, I come to the office with Christ. Actually, I, everywhere I go, see. And uh, it's good to visit the garden, and I love the garden, okay. But we want that garden to be our whole life. And that's the way it was before Adam and his wife, uh, I don't think Eve is, should take such a beating. I'm sure Adam was right there. Uh, and they left the garden. Their whole life was a garden. And Jesus invites us to make our whole life the garden of God and to return to his kingdom. But if we don't understand that, we will say, no, here's the secular over here, and there's the sacred over here. And we take care of the sacred by religious activities, and then we're on our own for the rest of it. And the rest of it turns out to be most of our life. But when we go into every aspect of our life with our mind set on the things of the Spirit then the Spirit brings a new life into everything. And that's what the world is waiting on. Now, I know there's a future to it, and I know the kingdom of God has a lot of other kingdoms competing with it now. But we are given to take the kingdom of God into the world where the kingdoms are in conflict, and that goes all the way down to individuals, uh, you, sometimes you go into a family and you find uh, a man and a woman who are running two kingdoms. It doesn't make for harmonious relations. Or it's parents and children. Or it's people at work. Or running the government. And uh, I'm, I'm uh, so thankful to be reminded of the meeting down in Houston that's going on. And I know a lot of those people, and they have really good hearts. And they're gathering to bring the kingdom of God as a force into actual life. See, I mean, you have to understand this the way this business of the church and state and all of that has been set up in our country to fundamentally isolate 
the state from the influence of God. And I'll tell you, if we ever succeed in getting a separation from church and state, we're in real trouble. Uh, now, of course, not in the sense that that non-establishment clause was originally meant. That's good, that's fine, but that's not what we're into now. We're into the idea that people who are carrying out their texts, their tasks in the world should be free of the influence of God. I was in South Korea a couple of weeks, uh, uh, just a month or so ago, and the same battle is going on there. It was a big battle because the uh, prime minister, had, who was a Christian, uh, attended a prayer meeting, and he and his wife bowed down, and they took a picture of them. And then there was a big brouhaha about that because, oh, that's not supposed to be a part of one's life as a minister of the state. Well, if it's not, what's going to be? See, that's the human dilemma. If you set aside Christ and the kingdom of God, what do you got? You've got to have something. What's going to guide you if you don't have that? And it's extremely important to, for us to understand that the mind of the Spirit opens up the kingdom of God to us wherever we are. Just another verse or two here. Verse 5 again, those who are in terms of the flesh set their mind on the things of the flesh. See, that's telling you how to be in terms of the flesh. And then again... Those who are according to the Spirit set your mind. So your mind is the key to your life. We have some degree of choice, and as Christ sets us free, a greater degree of choice as to where we put our minds. And note the next verse now. For the mind set on the flesh is death. Remember, the flesh are the natural powers of the visible world including our bodies. That's the flesh. Flesh is not bad. It's good when it is subordinated to the Spirit. When it is not subordinated to the Spirit, it takes on evil. And the evil is primarily in the form of self-will. I use the flesh to get my way. And the world uses the flesh to try to run its projects. I turn my mind to the Spirit, God, His Word, His law, His action in history, in the lives of people around me, and in the presence of Christ in my life. I turn my mind to that. That's, that's what it means to have your mind set on the Spirit. And if we do that, then... The mind set on the spirit is life and peace. Death, because one is set upon things that are temporary, that are going nowhere. You have a little run, and then it's all over. But if you set your mind on the things of the spirit, life and peace. See, that's why Jesus said in John Chapter 8, those who keep my word will never see death. Never see death. Never experience it. That's why in Hebrews 2, it talks about how he has freed anyone who trusts him from fear of death. And over and over, you hear that theme struck. I don't know, are you planning on dying? Well, most of you are going to be disappointed if you are, right? You won't experience death. What happens at death will be you will make a transition into the fullness of the life which you have already taken on because your mind is set on the Spirit. You're already living in a world that is beyond death. I don't know. Maybe you'll figure out after a while that you've, something has happened but you will not experience death because your life is already caught up in the eternal life of God. 
So now just a couple of other passages. The, the great uh, central passage for Renovare is 2 Corinthians 4, 16 through 18. 2 Corinthians 4, 16 through 18. And Paul is, in that passage, you may recall, he is talking about his life as a person who lives and works in the Spirit of God. And um, he got some pretty rough treatment. Uh, but he says now in verse 16 of 2 Corinthians 4, he says, Therefore we are not discouraged. We are not disheartened. Because while our outward man is perishing, the inward person is being renewed day by day. And that's the word renovare comes from the Latin Bible, renewed. Renovare, renewed day by day. For our momentary light affliction is working for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. Now then, how? While we look not at the things that are visible. See, that's the area of the flesh. And everything that's visible is passing away. It's just a question of time. Eventually, granite turns into sand. Everything visible is passing away. While we look not at the things that are visible or seen, but at the things that are unseen. Now, you have to think, how do you look at what is unseen? And that, again, is a question of where you are willing to place your mind Living in the presence of God from the human side is basically focusing your mind on God. Practicing the presence of God from the human side is primarily a matter of turning your mind to God. You ever wonder about it? The Bible tells us to seek the face of God. But God told Moses, if anyone saw there his face, they're dead. Isn't that interesting? You seek the face of God, and you find how God comes to us in a way that allows us to live before the face of God without dying, without it just wiping us out. See, you know, it's God's creation is so great, if we weren't 90 million miles or so from the sun, it would cook us. So all of God's energy, the sun is nothing compared to God, you know. We have to have God come to us and he presents himself to us in the form of Jesus Christ. That's why Jesus said to Thomas and to Philip, he that hath seen me has seen the Father. No one comes to the Father except by me, he said. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. He that has seen me has seen the Father, and from now on you have known him and you have seen him. So Jesus brings the kingdom to us, and we turn our mind to Jesus, and primarily when we are thinking about what is unseen, not visible, we're thinking about Jesus. And it's devotion to him that enables us to make our lives eternal lives. So just one more passage of Scripture now, because it's really important to have this down when you're trying to think about hearing God. Because hearing God is something that actually happens in the realm of the unseen. And you are already in that realm. Because you are a spiritual being. You live at the intersection of two landscapes. One is visible, the other is invisible. And your choice is where you will focus your attention. And it's in that area that hearing God 
happens. Just one other passage. Colossians 3, 1 through 4. If you have been resurrected or raised up with Christ, that is, you're now sharing his life that's given to you because of your faith and confidence in him, seek those things that are above where Christ is seated on the right hand of God. See, that's how the kingdom of God works. It works through him. He's the king. So since you're in this new life now, seek. Now, that tells us we might not do that. We might seek something else. And that's where the problem comes. But we have a new life now. It's working in us. And we can seek the things that are above where Christ is governing our world. Christ seated at the right hand of the Father means that he is the executive agent, the right hand. Now, it's okay if you're left-handed, you can say the left hand. That'll work for you, and that's just fine. The basic idea is that Christ is the executive power of God in your world. Set your affections on things above, not on things on the earth. For you are dead. That's good news, by the way. You know, it's like the story about the Presbyterian that fell down the stairs and got up and said, Wow, I'm glad that's over. So you can say, well, I'm glad death is over. I'm past that. Right? You are dead, and your life is hid. Now, there's so much here that it's hard not just to stay here. Because who you really are is hidden from you. Your life is hid. Huh? You don't know who you are. Your life is hid with Christ in God. Christ is hid now, isn't he? You have to seek him. You have to want him. His word won't run over you. It's there, but he's hid with Christ. You're hid with Christ in God. God is hidden. God is not obvious to people who have been set in another way. See, that shouldn't surprise us. I mean, it's only by the mercy of God that the world is not in a much worse shape than it is. Your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, you also will appear with him glorious. Now, many times the translations don't do justice to that. But what it's saying is you finally will begin to understand what God has done in your life, in creating you and in redeeming you. I like to use a, a little sentence to help people with this. Um, it's very simple, and maybe you can identify with it, and the sentence is just this. I am an unceasing spiritual being with an eternal destiny in God's great universe. I am an unceasing spiritual being with an... Now, you, you need to keep your mind on that. It's only as you keep your mind there that you can begin to take the kingdom of God wherever you are. And you can reign in life through one, Christ Jesus. Would you be willing to try to say that with me? I'll say it one more time, and then let's see if you can say it. I am an unceasing spiritual being with an eternal destiny in God's great universe. Hmm? Try it with me. I am an unceasing spiritual being with an eternal destiny in God's great universe. Now that's who we are. 
I, what do we say, 24-7? That's who we are. That's our future. You're never going to die because you have turned your mind to the Spirit and Christ is living in you and creating a way of life in which his companionship and instruction is standard. Now that's why it's so important for us to pay attention to this topic and in terms of pastoring and leading people, we need to keep constantly before them the reality of their lives in the kingdom of God. Now, a natural part of that is communication. And there are two main forms that this takes. One is the objective historical word of God. See, God has put that on the record. It's out here. It's in public. It exists in our Bible. It exists in the history of the people of God. Just take a simple thing like the Ten Commandments. Now, one of our great problems with being followers of Christ today is the illusion, delusion, that law is not good. That law is our enemy. And that is a tragic mistake. The root of that is the tendency of people to try to take law as their only guide to life. And law does not bring life. But it is given as the mercy of God to help direct us to life. And I'll tell you, for example, if you just take the Ten Commandments and say, suppose you were to say, it'll scare people around you, but suppose you say, I'm going to keep them. Well, you don't want to show up at church and say that, do you? No? Let me tell you what you don't also want to say. You, you don't want to show up at church and say, well, you know, I've decided not to keep the Ten Commandments. <laughs> Try that. <laughs> right. So actually, we don't know what to do with them. But the, the law of God is basically an indication of God's way, of God's kingdom. This is what God does. And he calls us to trust him and learn how to do what God does. And we need to know. Law is one of the greatest gifts and necessities of human life. And if you read Psalm 119, you'll see how important that is. Listen to this, just one statement from 119. Verse 165. Great peace have they who love thy law, for nothing will offend them. Nothing will offend them. They'll not stumble over anything because they're caught up in the beauty of God as seen through his law. Wouldn't you like to live a life where you never were offended? Great peace have they who love thy law because when you love the law, you see God in it and you know God's presence. So one form then that the Word of God takes is its presence in the world, in the Bible, in history, in the people of God. God's Word is speaking. But the other form is the personal Word from God to the individual who has chosen to live in the kingdom of God. As you see, if you, if you want to keep the law... Don't try to keep the law. You try to become the kind of person who keeps the law. Now, in our next session, we're going to be talking about the Sermon on the Mount because it is the absolute top-of-the-line presentation of the kingdom of God. See? 
So the law points us to God, but we need to be in personal communication with God, with Jesus Christ, under the direction of the Holy Spirit, if we're going to walk in that way. So you have those two forms. Now, the kingdom of God is gentle, and the way that the Scripture comes to us brings us to an understanding of how God speaks to us individually. But I don't miss it. We have the Word of God as present objectively in the world, primarily in the Bible and in the people of Christ. And then we have the Word of God as it comes to us individually. And we want now to talk at some length about how it comes to us individually. There's some things, some stories in the Bible that are very helpful uh, because we don't really understand how the Word of God comes to us individually, especially why it comes to us in such a gentle form that we can easily miss it. For example, one thing is people normally think if God speaks to them, they'll know who's speaking. And uh, so we need to look at some of these stories. The story of little Samuel, for example, in uh, 1 Samuel 3. I hope you all know that story. It's one of the sweetest stories in the Bible. Samuel was a child that had been committed to God by his mother. You know the story, I'm sure. And he lived in the tabernacle or in the uh, place where the ark was. Uh, he was directed by Eli, an older prophet. And Samuel, one night as he was sleeping, uh, someone spoke to him. And what I'd like you to get out of this is, first of all, Samuel did not recognize who was speaking to him. And that's something we want to keep in our minds. You don't automatically recognize when God speaks to you. You have to be in learning what that is like. And you know the story how Samuel went to Eli and said, you called me, and Eli said, no, I didn't call you. And he went back, and God spoke to him again, and he thought, still thought it was Eli. And the third time around, Eli understands what's happening. So important that we have people who can help us understand what is happening when God speaks to us. And he told Samuel what to do, and it's the, the perfect response. Speak, Lord for your servant hears. Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. And of course, that began arguably the greatest or one of the greatest conversations between human beings and God that we have on record. So that's one thing we want to keep in mind. We have to learn what the voice of God is like. It doesn't present its credentials up front. And actually, if it did, we probably wouldn't know what to do with it. Because the way that God speaks to us, it can come in many ways. But the preferred way is direct communication, word of mouth. So let me give you one other story here, and that's the story of Moses, it's in the 12th chapter of Numbers. And uh, in this case, uh, there was some problems with uh, Miriam and Aaron about their place before God, and Miriam especially got worked up about, well, you know, I'm, I'm just as good as Moses. So why, do, why can't I exercise leadership and be up front like him? And uh, so the Lord came down and explained it to them. That's the way the Lord works. And uh, you'll notice in verse 6 of Numbers 12, 
Hear now my words. God is standing now and speaking uh, to Miriam and Aaron and Moses. And he says, If there is a prophet among you, I, the Lord, will make myself known to him in a vision. I will speak with him in a dream. Now, we know that is one way that God speaks to people. But what you want to learn from this passage is, it is not the preferred way. One of the advantages of that way of speaking is it gets your attention. And many people aren't paying much attention to God. And uh, so there are various ways that God presents himself to people. And he says here, if there's a prophet, I will give him a vision. I will give him a dream. But now notice the next verse. Not so with my servant Moses. Not so. What is the way that he speaks? He says, with him I speak mouth to mouth. That's conversational. Even openly, not in dark sayings, and he beholds the form of the Lord. That's a conversational relationship. What's the problem with visions and dreams? They always require interpretation. The meaning of a vision or a dream is not on the surface. God's word to you when he speaks to you, the meaning will be clear. See? Now, clarity is important for the direction of life. If you have a vision, you don't necessarily know where it came from or what it means. But God speaks clearly. That's why his revelation in the Bible is in plain words, not in images and visions, except where those are provided with an interpretation. See, now, it's really important to understand that because if we aren't careful, we will elevate visions and dreams. And we'll think, I want a vision, I want a dream. Or someone tells their vision and their dream, and we think that's wonderful. Not necessarily. What is wonderful is when God speaks to you in plain words and tells you what to do. Now, just one other scriptural passage here, and that's 1 Kings 19. And it's important for us to take in these lessons and see what they have to say to us about God speaking to us. And now I'm, then we're going to talk about exactly the form that God's Word takes to each of us. You all know this story. This is the story of Elijah. And uh, Elijah is a fascinating character, isn't he? Uh, he was a mighty person in many ways. But on the other hand, uh, when he was not doing his mighty things, he was rather weak. You know, he calls down fire out of heaven and wipes out a bunch of false prophets and all of that. And then a little woman says to him, Elijah, I'm going to get you. And Elijah takes off like a rocket. <laughs> And you wonder, he must have been exhausted or something. I mean, he'd been worn out with ministry, and now this little woman says, I'm going to kill you. And um, he runs. And he has uh, a lot of uh, self-absorption. You begin to see this. And he winds up in Mount Horeb, the mountain of God. And you know the story, the wind and the earthquake and the fire. But God was not in them. And then there was, it's very hard to translate uh, the language here. We say a still small voice, but it's more like a kind of murmuring sound, very quiet, very calm. And Elijah recognized 
That was the voice of God. Okay. What is the form that the Word of God, as it comes to us, takes? Well, it takes the form of thoughts that are given to us in the process of Jesus teaching us. Just thoughts. Can God speak to you audibly? Yes, he can. Um, there are many ways that he can make an impression, but I want to just emphasize the way God's word will come to you as a disciple of Jesus is through a special form of thoughts. And you will learn to recognize that by experience. God will speak to you and you will know that by thoughts that come to you with a special characteristic that we'll talk more about in a moment. So you have the objective word of God comes in many ways and then as a disciple you are learning how to live in the teaching that has been given to you. And in the process of learning that, Christ speaks to you. And that speaking comes in the form of thoughts that have a special character which you learn to recognize by experience. Now forgive me if I'm, I won't see, I, I need to go over this so carefully so that at least you will be able to get a hold of it, understand what it is like because there is so much, I think, misguided information about how God communicates with us and what it does for us that we need to be very careful. As disciples, we want to understand that the parable of the sower applies to each of us all the time. The sower is Jesus. And he uses people, of course, to do that. And he speaks through people. And he sows the word of the kingdom. But it isn't passive on the side of those who receive the word. I can lose the word of God that comes to me because I'm distracted. Distraction is the first way of losing the word in the parable of the sower. Do you remember? The sower sows the word, and some fall out on the pathway here, and the birds come and take it away. That's distraction. The enemy uses distraction. We go to church, and we hear a good word, and by the time we're out the door... We've forgotten it. Or we got it, but we didn't take it in and really seize it and make it our own. See, that's the one on the shallow ground. And then there's the seed that fell into the thorns and the weeds and the cares of this world and uh, various kinds of things exist along with the seed, and the seed sprouts and grows up, but it is crowded out by other things. It's still there. And then there's the part that falls in the good ground, and it brings forth fruit. Now, you see, we are apt to think that's evangelism. We're apt to think that that only applies to conversion or something of that sort. But this is a teaching about your life and my life constantly. The word of the kingdom is coming to us, comes to us in the Bible, comes to us in the speaking of the heart, but it comes as a still, small voice that we have to pay careful attention to in order to make it fruitful in our lives. You know, when I was, I was converted when I was nine years old. 
It was a genuine event, changed my little world, uh, but my world was very little, and I had to grow. And uh, really, uh, I was in the midst of, a, of wonderful people and all of that, but they didn't know how to cultivate growth. And so I more or less had to approach my life as a teenager and so on, as someone who only knew heaven, not life. See? And so I didn't receive any instruction, and I became, I think, a moderately wicked young man. <laughs> right? And um, I, I didn't forget about Jesus, but no one helped me grow until later on in my late teens, I had some experiences that began to help me see that eternal life is now, not later. Eternal life is now, it's eternal living. And I began then to understand how to approach the scripture and how to listen to God teach me in relation to the scripture. See, the scripture tells us wonderful things, but how do you do it? See, that's where you have to bring together the objective teaching of God in the word and in history and in his people with his teaching in your individual heart about how to do it. Just an illustration. I see, Jesus says, love your enemies. I really wasn't, it didn't seem to me like a good idea. <laughs> it just didn't. And so it's, it sat there on the pages of the scripture, a challenge that I didn't have any idea how to deal with. One day Jesus spoke to me and said, have you thought about how it is if you don't love your enemies? Have you considered the lives of people who hate their enemies? And he began to take me through a teaching. And then he began to teach me about what happens to your enemy when you love them. And a teaching, you know if you love your enemy, that doesn't mean that you let them do what they want to. Did you know that loving someone often means you don't let them do what they want to? Hmm? Now, you know that with a child, right? Because uh, we bring our children up, and we know that one of the things that we do, if we love them, is we don't let them do what they want to. Because in many cases, they wind up dead if you do that. But one of the main lessons that we have in loving our children is to help them learn not to do what they want to. Right? So now, see, I see this verse here, love your enemies, and I don't know what to do with it. I just don't know what to do with it. Well, that's because I have to be taught more about what it means, what love is, what it isn't, and we're in real confusion on that topic in our world. Love, for many people, they think it's the same thing as desire. And they say things like, I love chocolate cake. They don't love chocolate cake. If you're a chocolate cake and you hear someone standing there saying, I love chocolate cake, you know you're in trouble. <laughs> You don't love chocolate cake, you want to eat it. Yeah. That's not love. So we have to learn how to separate things like love from desire. That teaching comes to the disciple through the speaking 
of Jesus in our minds. It comes quietly, but forcibly into our lives. It comes because we seek the teacher. We are his students, and we are receiving his word into our hearts. Now, when, when we do that, we learn to identify when the speaker is the teacher. And this is so powerful that John, in the, his first letter, you remember, said, you don't need a teacher. You've got a teacher. There's an unction in you that teaches you. Of course, then he goes right ahead and teaches them anyway, and that's what he should do because, of course, he's teaching with the teacher. But what we learn is when we hear the voice of Jesus in our mind, and that's where it will come, we learn that it has a certain quality to it. Um, for example, it never scolds you. Jesus doesn't scold. He teaches. We really have to shift our thinking about this because we're so used to being hammered with guilt. And even in the scriptures, the teachings of Jesus... Like, for example, in Luke 6, he says, Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not the things that I say? Now, you see, if we don't understand the quality of the voice, we're apt to think that he's saying something like, If you had the brains God gave a goose, you'd do what I say. <laughs> but he's not. He's, he's saying, Why is it? Why? Why? And there's an answer to that question. And he'll teach us the answer to the question. The quality of the voice is one that is weighty but gentle. It's weighty but gentle. It comes with a force to it. And you will learn that as you go on your way as a disciple of Jesus, a student of Jesus, you will learn there is a certain authority that comes with that voice. Now, I myself didn't know that for many years, but when I came to understand it, then I could look back and see how God had spoken to me many times before. But I didn't know it was him. I just thought, well, where did it come from? Uh, maybe from me or someone else. But you see, there is a weight of authority that comes with the voice, and you learn to recognize. Secondly, there's a spirit that comes with that voice. And that spirit is not one of condemnation. Most people think that God just condemns. <laughs> That's all he does. But actually, you know, God isn't uh, an unhappy person. God is a joyous being, and he has worlds to be happy about. And uh, he's not fussy and condem condemning. You know, condemning doesn't help. And that's why Jesus taught us in Matthew 7, don't go into condemnation. And that doesn't mean he doesn't discern. Discernment is not condemnation. If your dentist examines your teeth and says you've got a cavity there, he's not condemning you. He's discerning. That's different. And Jesus teaches us to be discerning without being condemning. And that's how his word comes to us. And if you've got a word that is coming to you that is condemning you and leading you into guilt, you should not take it as seriously as you're likely to. The devil is the accuser of the brethren and of the cistern. And he really likes to load you with guilt. But there are few things 
that are more harmful than guilt. The word doesn't come with guilt. It comes with a spirit of openness and truth, and it instructs you, and it helps you understand. Thirdly, it comes with a content that matches what is already there in the Scripture. So you have a kind of quality, a spirit, and a content that can help you recognize the Word of God that is coming to you individually. The content will always match the principles of Scripture. What the Bible teaches is what it teaches on the whole, not what one verse teaches. And if you try to do it in terms of what one verse teaches, you'll be constantly led astray, and there will be all kinds of battles that will come out of it. For example, you'll read a verse that says, men should not have long hair, or women should not have haircuts, right? Uh, a dear old man of my childhood, a preacher, wrote a book called Bobbed Hair, Bossy Wives, and Women Preachers. <laughs> and you can guess he was against all of them. <laughs> and actually, there's, some verse, there's a few verses that suggest that. But that's not the message of the Scripture. You go for the principles what is taught over and over and over and over again. And what comes out of the Bible on an interpretation, a fair interpretation of the whole book, you allow the Bible to interpret the Bible, is the teaching of the Scripture. God will not tell you to jump off of a building. He will not tell you to do something foolish in the light of the Scripture. May be foolish in the light of the wisdom of men, but not in the light of the Scripture. And so his teaching will always be conforming to the content of the Scripture. So you have three things there now. But just very quickly, they do not make you infallible. If God is speaking to you, he is infallible, but you're still not. God spoke through Balaam's ass, but he was still a jackass after it was over. <laughs> God does not make us infallible. So when we take this teaching about the nature of the word that comes to us, we want to understand that this is always in a context of our fallibility. And that means, among other things, if we're not sure, ask again. And here another biblical case, the case of Gideon, is very helpful. God told Gideon, sent an angel to him, told him to do something which in the light of the wisdom of men was pretty foolish because it really amounted to political revolution. And Gideon said, you know, I don't know why you're telling me this. I'm not, I'm not the kind of person who can do this. And you remember Gideon's device of putting out a fleece. Okay. Now, I don't have time to go into that story. I think you already know it. I just want to draw the lesson here. God speaking to us does not make us certain, and it does not make us infallible. Never hesitate to go back to God and say, what was that? What did you say? You can test the Word of God. It does not make God mad. It's the natural course of a loving relationship between a teacher and a disciple. So now, we have to break in just a moment, but I, I want you to just really understand the Word of God comes to us in our thoughts. It's also present in the Scripture. But individually, we need direction. 
And God gives direction to his people. He gives individuals direction as to what they should do. Now then, that isn't just a religious thing. That's where you want to take that into all of your life. I mentioned last night the, the people who were on the oil platform down in the Gulf of Mexico that blew up. If the people on that platform had been disciples of Jesus, listening for what he had to say, he would have told them what to do. Maybe he did. I don't know them individually. If the Christians, who were lawyers and accountants in the system that just led to our contemporary crash, if the Christians had done what God wanted them to do, and in many cases, we wouldn't be in the mess we're in today. See? God is interested in every aspect of our lives, and he takes us in hand as his disciples, and he instructs us. He doesn't just give us the Bible. That's wonderful. But he talks to us from the Bible. And we'll have a little more to say about this this afternoon. But we need to...